So, um, so our initial idea that was to create an infrastructure for us to communicate between the people, between the participant, wasn't happening really because people were was mainly using the community network to access uh, multinational services like Google, like Facebook, like YouTube, and so on. And yeah, we could we could be like, ah, oh, yeah, we have the faster network of of blah, blah, but that wasn't really satisfying to us. And, and, and so what in, in our minds started to have this kind of inquietude about what we can do about that. So I started my long journey in, uh, in looking for um, technologies and applications that really empowered use to um, to communicate between each other without relying on an external service and uh, on the on a far away like uh, Facebook and so on. So we, uh, um, oh, I don't know if it's working. Uh, so we installed, uh, we tried that at, uh, at some point there was this huge bubble about federated social network. At that point, the most, the most popular was diaspora. So we installed the uh, diaspora. Initially, it was used by internally by the, the people, but then we made it visible also on the internet. We got also uh, public IP from the pirated university connection. And, uh, and all of a sudden, we had like uh, uh, 30,000 users on diaspora. So on our own, just our, our server. That required a lot of maintenance and so on. No one made donations. So it was like all on spare time. And, when, and then one day, it, uh, well, before of that, uh, so the network sometimes split. Um, oh, but don't worry, I can, I can go with the slide, uh, without the slide, if you, or, or just put. OK, so, uh, so sometimes the network did split. So because it is federated, but it still depends on every node, it's a server. So from the whole network, uh, every time you wanted to message to someone that maybe was your your neighbor, your message go to the to the uh, diaspora pod and then get back to your neighbor. So if in the middle one of the node was broken, you couldn't do that. And and then and then one day what what happened is that uh, the diaspora pod crashed, the database got corrupted. We we didn't have that time to do proper backups and so on. We, no one was, was paying us to maintain a 30,000 user service. So, so we didn't feel actually responsible of, of the database got lost. We didn't sell the data to anyone. The promise was, was accomplished. But the people were was really hungry. So, so my, my journey kept going on, uh, looking for more technologies, etc. At some point, I found uh, RetroShare, that is a friend-to-friend -friend network, so the connection are direct between uh, trusted uh, peers. So if, if you message someone, the message travel directly to that person, and, and, the, the, and there exists no server. But the problem with that is uh, that wasn't that friendly. It didn't add a so friendly user interface and so on. So I'll, I'll, along this year, I've been contributed uh, to the to the project, to RetroShare, and then um, I came in contact with other people that they were working with the indigenous tribes and so on, and uh, and got more information about other users' cases that would be in interesting for that for for that technology, and uh, and we and together with Alter Mundi and now it's all, also Panos with Netwood is, is participating. We came up with this El Repo.io idea that is an, an application that is completely decentralized based on this uh, friendship uh, mesh network and um, to share and take care of cultural assets. So basically, you, for example, if you have a video of some social events of, of, of your tribe, you can share it on, the, on this platform. And it's, it's basically when you sh first share it, it stays on your, on your device. And then uh, communication is made to your friend that this content is available. 
your friend may be interested, so may may just their experience is to view that content. But what's happening is that that content is being uh, uh, copied on their device to be. To th this happens also when you look at a video on YouTube, but you have no control over that. Uh, okay. And. Um, Ooh. Ah, this is a KDE too. Cool. <laughs> ah, okay, open with a, yes. a browser. Yeah, it's okay, but they uh, need to be in, other, in the other screen. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, so so from all those experience, we we came to the understanding that uh, that we needed something that permit us to to share and take care of our uh, cu uh, cultural uh, heritage and creations. Um, it needed to be decentralized. It needed to be censorship resistance. Yet. Um, we, we needed to protect ourselves from spam because the, we, we, we always had problems with trolls that come and put shit contents all, all over. And, but this, this protection from spam and trolling needed to, to not be uh, a problem for the plurality of the, of the medium. So the, um, that many, ma many very different opinions can, can stay there. And, and yet, the spam won't propagate. Uh, we, need, we had needs of, um, of, of pu publi publish and take care of contents, both in an anonymous way or in the in choice of the author in a recognizable way. And, um, and it should it, it need uh, to keep working even if the internet go down or parts of the network go down. And well. There is um, ob uh, obviously to 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 get to the get those objective you you need to use cryptography and so on. So basically, uh, a friend to friend network. This is my social graph on on RetroShare. So you have many nodes. Uh, the direct connections only happens to uh, uh, trusted nodes. That means know that you are not afraid of to show your IP or, inform or some information about you. And then through, those, um, those th through the, that trust network, you can reach out anyone else. So you can see here the like, uh, first and second level of trust in, on my social graph, but you can actually um, communicate with anyone else at arbitrary distance. Uh, on, on top of this network, how we do propagate the contents? So one, we have the uh, multiple mechanisms. One of them is turtle routing. So for example, if uh, someone uh, asks, uh, do, you, uh, do you want to download a file that someone else has? If that someone else may be far away, so you may don't know who it, who it is. It's actually turtle routing is anonymous. So uh, you send a request. On the, well, your software send a request through the network about I am interested in this in this file. The the request propagate up until it finds some viable sources of those files, and those sources reply back. And all of this happens in a, in an anonymous way, so you don't really uh, the people who provide the content doesn't know who is requesting it, and the people who are getting the content doesn't know who have that content. 
actually no one in the network except of you know that you are downloading that content and no one in the network except you know that you have that content but the network is made in a way that you can find the content and then the the content is routed uh, a, a tunnel is created between the, the potential sources and the, and the one who need that file and the and the content is routed to to who we need it it's this this mechanism is uh, is encrypted so no one can can look into what content is passing by and uh, and it's suitable for even lightweight or uh, ev communication so you can you can share with that mechanism also very big files without problem another another system it's uh, uh, that uh, that it's implemented uh, in uh, retrochain so in, in repo.io it's general exchange, sy exchange system the ben the main benefit about general exchange si system over turtle routing is that in turtle routing to have a communication both peers need to be online at the same moment to have an, ex an exchange while in uh, in general exchange system that's not a requirement so you can uh, create the content that content start to propagate over the subscribers network and then you can you can go offline and someone that is interested in that content can get that content even if uh, if you are not online in that moment, because the information is cached in the in the nodes of the of the network, of course it has its drawback. It's, it has a high, high level of redundancy, so you can't use a uh, general exchange system by itself to share like big files. But you could, for example, use it to announce a file is now available, or send an email, or send a, a chat message that are small. Sm that have small sites. Uh, on, on top of that, we uh, this has been uh, developed in the context of El Repo. Uh, we have we have developed I think that a module that's called Deep Search. So the contents and the messages and this, these things get indexed by with Xapian, and uh, basically uh, you get more or less the feature of a. Uh, of us, uh, a search motor is said in English, and a search engine, so like something like Google, but Google is centralized and the content yeah, it access are are centralized in other service. But while this is this provide a um, a very good and efficient search but over a over a, a completely decentralized network, that is quite innovative feature. But you can remember like Emule and stuff like that add some kind of search. But it was like very bare-bone. You can search about the name, and it, did, it didn't really work. So of course, as it, there is no profiling, there is no, uh, there is, uh, no artificial um, uh, manipulation of, of data, and, and so on. Algorithmically manipulation of data, <laughs> and, and so on. Uh, well, and th that's is. I, I said to you that RetroShare is old style uh, graphical interface that no one liked and so on. So just that's just to show. And uh, well, it's written in C++ and extensible through an API and so on. A work that I made to make it more more palatable to new developers. It's exposed a JSON, uh, exposed the whole C++ API as, as a REST API, so you can use it from any language, so JavaScript and etc. And uh, well, and and this this permit to 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 use RetroShare as a small daemon and and create more attract user attractive uh, application on top of of it. So the the JSON API it's it's really easy, easy to use. It's, um, it doesn't require, because it's automatically generated, it doesn't require us to um, more manual work to keep it uh, up updated with the C++ API. So the JSON API, the C++ API are always feature pair with a mechanism I, I, I coded. And, uh, and, and to, for a function to be exposed through the API, it must be documented uh, through Doxygen. So the API is, is documented too. And so uh, this is, uh, I, I show you like how to, how to use it. Um, 
because well, I, I left the more the more po uh, the more social and political part to Panos and, and Tiago. So basically, um, this is a an, an FP, a C++ API of RetroShare. You have this class that's a REST login helper with the method uh, get locations. Uh, it does, as you can see, it's documented. Say what to do. You can see it as uh, take a, a vector as parameter to store the the location, and and then this this pointer it's exposed to to the user of the API. So from from the JSON API, you don't need to handle pointers and stuff like that. You just need to know this, that name, that is the name of the class and the name of the method, and then you can just call it. So on, with you, you, can, you can call it uh, from, from, from your shell, for example, with uh, Carl. How, how many of you know Carl? So basically, uh, I, I, made, I, I made it into line, so it's, uh, it fit. So basically, it's HTTP, localhost, and then the, the path of the method, that is errors login helper, get locations, and it returned this, this nice JSON that you can handle very e easily in any, in any language. So as you can see, do you remember I said that location was a vector? The vector in JSON is uh, represented as an array, and inside the array there is the object like location that has a location ID, a PGP ID, a location name, and so on. So you actually got, ac it's like you got access to the C++ API, but from any other language. Uh, so for example, okay, this is a, another example with an, another method. That's, that is a method to generate an invite, to an Im invite a friend to your node, and it's called rsrp slash get retrocher invite, and you get this this JSON result. So the, the, those examples are through shell, but most of the people prefer to develop things from other languages, like for example Python. You can do the same thing uh, from Python, the path of the method, and, and, and the RS peers get peer details, and you get back the, the result inside this variable. And then you can access uh, like I, uh, inside the from the details. I want to to see the the PGP ID of that location, and you can access it like a, as a plain dictionary. Of course, you can do it also from JavaScript in a web page. You can uh, you can use the JSON API. Uh, you can see here RS JSON API request, RS peers accept invite. This is extracted from from a real web page that uses the the Resurgent JSON API, and uh, and that's it. It's like you can just uh, take advantage of the Resurgent API from from any web page. Um, yeah, and it's you you can use the the API from from any from almost any uh, modern language that support HTTP and JSON. And well, and. It's documented. <laughs> and those are some examples of things that have been developed through that API. This has an app. It is on my old mobile phone. It's, uh, it's a prototype to chat with people through this decentralized network. And it's made through with QML that is something like JavaScript. These are uh, early screenshots from elrepo.io. So people were started using it to, to share photos. And, and put some comments, and it, and, and this was pretty sta straightforward. It's like they just they take their own their uh, JavaScript preferred framework, and uh, and just inter use the API and and got the data that they wanted to display to the user and uh, and publish it and so on. More examples. And well, you are you are welcome to to contribute, and uh, we have we we uh, we try to participate to Google Summer of Code or other or other funding source every every time it's available. It's not that we particularly like Google or the other funders, but it's who 
you know the golden rule. Was the goals make the rules? So. <laughs> and thanks for to, to those organizations that have helped me in all of these things. So if you have see if you have uh, questions, you you are welcome. Okay, let's let's give. It. Thank you, Gio. Um, you, you said that you had about 30,000 users in a city, I understand? No. So what's happened is that in the city we had, we had like about 100 users. But then when we, when we opened the, the okay. service also on the internet. On the internet, okay. Yeah, the people that were from the city started to say to their friends from other places, ah, we can talk uh, on, the, on, on that service. So the people started to to join and tell to their friend and so on, and, that, and then I see. explode. So when you adopted RetroShare, you put, you had boxes in the city. Tell me about what, what the device was that was running RetroShare. Uh, not, not, uh, RetroShare is, is just running on your own laptop or on your PC. And then we had some, some someone had it running also on their own small box and embed like our I don't know what were Raspberry Pi doesn't existed at the time, but similar things like NAS that used to to share files and so on. Okay, so you just had like a, a very traditional mesh network TCP/IP, and you were connecting pe people were putting on their laptop yeah. the RetroShare. Okay, thanks. So, so you didn't go much into the details, but you basically say that this uh, software implements a distributed, reliable, redundant, anonymous, but in some ways authenticated protocol with tons of crypto. Yeah. Now, that's more or less the holy grail of all that I've been trying to do this since a few decades ago. And I it's a bit risky to say it like that, meaning that uh, there have been a lot of people trying to do this. So if you don't want to go into the details, m I think you should maybe be a little more clear about at least who is your, I don't know, adversary model. So okay. because, you know, uh, I'm, as long as we are geeks that like to uh, encrypt things and feel safer, then it's okay. A couple of talks ago, there were people talking about massive killings and government and, and so I think you must be a bit, a bit more precise about how you develop this, how, how you plan, what are your adversary, what can you resist, how was it developed, and what's the story of it? Okay, uh, I, I prefer usually to leave this kind of details to the question time, so I can, I can answer. <laughs> if, if I, I prefer to not scare the people at the beginning with the threat model, say what, what was that, no? and stuff like that. Uh, so, so I can answer it. So basically, uh, RetroShare by itself has a, has a diverse developers community. So we have, we have from the most paranoid, that is every feature they implement and every time there is a pull request, they review it like 10 times before uh, accepting it. Um, through to the most uh, usability um, focused person so that there is this this m and and between those two opposite, there is many, uh, many souls, many different souls. So we don't as RetroShare doesn't have um, uh, like a a clear threat model. There is, but there is many colors on inside of the co development community. In El Repo.io, our our main uh, uh, goals is not it's like no, it's not that crypto is the first things we want to address. The first thing we want to address is people to be able to communicate in, uh, over networks that are not that reliable, over networks that uh, internet is not always available, and, and so on. And then uh, crypto is it's, but it's working already, but we don't, um, we don't do like, uh, it's, no, it's not our first priority ob objective. But uh, in, in the current implementation, uh, a global observer could uh, uh, some way see there is some flows of data that go through the network. But it's very difficult to do an analysis of those flows because as the services are mixed 
and um, there is this continuous, there is this uh, double nature of synchronous and asynchronous communication. The, uh, an, an adversary that observes the network would be really confused of what, what's happening there. Except if maybe, if you are transferring, like if there is two nodes that make a, 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 um, a huge amount uh, of transfers and all other nodes do very few transfers, maybe a node server could guess those two nodes are like, uh, are important nodes in the network in, in terms of traffic. And also they could guess about centrality of those, of, of those nodes, if they are central or not. But they, couldn't, they could not um, see more than that. The, uh, the other thing is if, if the adversary managed to break into your device, then you are screwed because it could, uh, we could see wha what are your trusted nodes, so it could, can discover the IPs of those trusted nodes. And, but if they can break in your device, hardly any, any technology can, can protect from you from that. So can I summarize this saying that this is uh, extremely experimental technology, which is generally better than using other proprietary centralized tools, yeah. but you will not like, put your life at stake on this kind of stuff? Well, r right, right now, no. I wouldn't put my life on. on, on it's it's pretty well. RetroShare is as is as many years. So the crypto is is quite good actually because we have we have been having many attacks, many attempts of attacks that apparently they couldn't make it to to break into. That's um, uh, RetroShare and it's crypto. But this these new things, it's that's quite new. And yes, of course. It doesn't have 10 years of pen testing and stuff like that on top of it. And, and when you tr start to use JavaScript and these kind of languages that the people... Well, I was more referring to the, to the protocols and things like uh, TLS 1.0 was made by an alliance of multi-billion uh, companies and it was broken. 1.1 was broken. 1.2... So yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> you know, it takes a lot of time and energy to say that this is more or less secure. So I'm fine with the experimental technology. Yeah, yeah, of course, experimental. We don't even have a stable release yet. <laughs> uh, what transport does it use? Does it use store with uh, Onion services or? Uh, so um, initially, RetroShare used the uh, TCP uh, and uh, SSL on top of it, but. Uh, then we implement the transport over UDP and also and, and then over Tor and over E2P. So you, you can use many different things as transports. The, the more usual is, uh, is TLS connection between uh, direct nodes. And then on top of that, there is turtle routing or GXS that use their own encryption. So it's, uh, there is the, the connection layer is encrypted, and then the, uh, the layer on top of that has different kinds of encryption depending on the kind of routing and service. Um, I, d I just wanted to speak a bit to the uh, the, the security question because, um, I mean, I I've not really looked at the code, but I know it's Carlo von Links, and he v cares a lot about security. And in general, I usually consider if somebody says this is private, it's probably true. If somebody says it's anonymous, like the gold standard of anonymity is Tor, and there's never been a case where somebody hid behind Tor and the U.S. government couldn't eventually find out who they were. One way or another, they found them. So, like, I never, I always basically trust if somebody says it's private. If they say it's anonymous, I always take it with a grain of salt. Um, and, like, uh, in, um, in cases where there are, like, merger acquisition uh, projects with companies and there is actually somebody who wants to figure out what they're saying, uh, what I understand that's done in business is they, they type it up on a typewriter they put it in an envelope, they give it to a courier that they trust, and they bicycle it across town and to give it to the other person because in that case, they just don't cr trust computers. So, I mean, it, it, depending on your threat model, like you might just say, you know what? I don't trust a computer because it has a million lines of code and any of that could get attacked. Yeah, also, also the, the thing is how easy is the, it becomes for the people to communicate. Like, um, uh, for us, it's like uh, many of, of 
of the people we interact to. It's like the the alternative to that is write message on on WhatsApp or on, or on Facebook when internet works. If internet doesn't work, they doesn't even have that that means of communication. And also, actually, um, uh, just sorry, um, no more. actually uh, sending things to like centralized providers, depending on who your threat is is often a, a pretty good solution because like if you send it with Gmail to somebody else who's on Gmail, unless Google is your threat, that can actually be a pretty good solution. But the, the, with El Repollo, where our, our first goal is to empower the people so they can take care of their cultural assets. So it's in the, it, the security around El Repollo is, is mainly used to keep private um, information that people want to keep private because it's their own, like it's my birthday pictures and stuff like that, they don't want to share them with the whole world. But it's, it's not the, um, the, the initial uh, target of El Repollo is not to make a, like a, a military grade uh, communication platform. Just, uh, just for, just yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But e even that, if uh, like everybody starts encrypting and so on, like your weakest link, if you don't trust Gmail or Google, that could go away. So that's really good. And it would enable like everybody to use by default, uh, have somewhat private conversation and so on. So yeah, it's a real progress. Any more questions? I think we're good to go for lunch now. Thank you very much, Jill.